What's good, y'all? Ebony Chappelle here, checking in with some more positivity for your timeline. So, growing up, one of my favorite things to do was to read. Um, I would read any and everything that I can get my hands on. I stayed in the library, but my favorite things to read were things written by Black women for Black women. It really changed my life the first time somebody put a Maya Angelou book in my hands, a Toni Morrison book in my hands, and you know, I could just go on and on, the list goes on. Um, but now there are two new books that are out, one by Ashley Cassandra Ford called Somebody's Daughter, and another by Tamara Winfrey Harris called Dear Black Girls. And both of these books I think are going to do for young women, older women, films, you know, people of all ages, what it's going to do for them is the same things that those books did for me when I was growing up. And I just think it is incredible to celebrate these authors. Something else that's really cool is that they're both based here in Indiana. So I feel like we are just so lucky here and we don't even know it. Um, Ashley's book is a memoir. It's her memoir. And I am so excited to read it. I haven't read it yet. Um, but I just know that it's going to be incredible. And Tammy's book, Dear Black Girl, I actually have read and it is filled with these letters um, from Black women. And it's just, it's a game changer. And it's something that I just think will be really, really good for people's lives. So because I'm me and I'm corny and I think that it's funny to make jokes, I thought about it and I was like, you know, if I were to write a memoir, you know, one day to reflect this time in my life, what would the title be? And I came up with some titles. Um, we're gonna see if any of these are legit. Okay, so um, this first title is inspired by a comedian, um, you know, a black female comedian. And every time you see her on TV, she's just always dancing and just full of joy. Um, but if you knew her story and you knew where that came from, then you would understand. So my first fake memoir title is I Know Why Tiffany Haddish. <laughs> so my first fake memoir title is I Know Why Tiffany Haddish Dances All the Time. Okay, these may get progressively worse, but we're, so we're sticking with it because we are going to commit to this bit. We're going to do it. All right. So I have struggled with acne ever since I was a teenager. Um, I am really getting ready to come up on my Jesus year and it's still a thing. So this second fake memoir title is um, in honor of my skin troubles. Acne tried to steal my joy but retinol may save it all. <laughs> and last but not least, this memoir, this fake memoir title is inspired by um, the fact that I refuse to throw things away. Um, I am not a hoarder. That is no offense to hoarders, but a hoarder I am not. I just like to think that I am really resourceful and that resourcefulness has showed up in other ways in my life. So this third memoir title is dedicated to the Girl Scout in me that um, just figures shit out. And it goes, you can do something with that tissue paper and other lessons about using everything you've got to get everything you want. And that is my third and final fake memoir title. I am not being published by anyone right now. And yeah, that's that's pretty much where we're at with that. But on a more serious note, I had an opportunity to catch up with Tamara Winfrey Harris um, recently to talk about her book. And I'm gonna share that interview with you guys. Also, Tamara and I are the co-founders of the Black Women's Writing Society. So every second Tuesday of the month, we meet via Zoom um, and we meet at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it's just an incredible moment. We have an hour of uninterrupted writing time. So all of my Black women and femme writers out there that are busy, you know, running the world, saving the world, trying to take care of yourself and all of that shit, you know, sometimes you do not make the time for yourself to do the things that you really want to do with your craft. So this hour of uninterrupted writing time is your gift to yourself. We invite you to join us. 
Um, also, we have great guest speakers that come. So it's something that you definitely want to check out. You can find out more information on Facebook at Black Women's Writing Society. So without further ado, let's get into that interview with Tamara Winfrey Harris. So for people that have not been blessed to know your amazingness and come to understand your work, tell the people a little bit about yourself, Tammy. So I am a writer and I specialize in race and gender and kind of the ways they intersect with politics and pop culture and current events. Um, I, my work has appeared in the New York Times and the Atlantic and Cosmopolitan and other outlets. My first book, which is The Sisters Are All Right, Changing the Broken Narrative of Black Women in America came out in 2015. And that book was about the stereotypes that have followed black women over centuries and then how we really live today. My second book, which I'm excited about, which is out in March, is Dear Black Girl, Letters from Your Sisters on Stepping Into Your Power. And it is more than 30 letters from black women to black girls that are feminist and body positive and LGBTQ positive and pro-black girl all wrapped up in my analysis. Oh, and I'm also along with Ebony Chappelle, the co-founder of the Black Women's Writing Society in Indianapolis. Woo! No, um, a little <laughs> sidebar real quick, but um, your friend and another amazing writer, um, Deisha Filial, I remember, I think I was listening to you guys on Clubhouse uh -huh. or I was reading an interview with her or something uh -huh. and she was saying that you have great ideas and she was going along with you for the ride, whatever <laughs> it is that you guys were doing. And that's literally how I feel about the Black Women's Writing Society, like, that just coming together, I was like, wow, this is a really wonderful idea. Yes, this, yes, we should do this. This will be great. And three years in, it's been amazing. And I can't even believe can't, we're in our third year. Like three years, what? Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So yeah, um, just grateful to know you and to be able to work alongside you on that and help to foster uh, more amazing Black women writers. Um, so speaking of the Sisters Are All Right, I know that you have another edition of that that is coming out. Um, that's how I first came to know you was when you were working on that. Um, did you know that it was going to have the kind of impact that it did? I didn't, I hoped, because you know, writing that book was a fulfillment of a lifelong dream. Like I had wanted to write a book, get a book published since I was like a little kid. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought maybe it would be received very well. I mean, I wrote that book for us. I wrote it for black women and just, I knew how often our stories are ignored or what, or, you know, how often people talk about us or talk at us instead of talking to us. So I felt like it would resonate because here are Black women's stories and I actually interviewed more than 100 Black women about this and I thought that was important and it was different than what was happening at the time, but I had no idea. I just kind of crossed my fingers and hoped for the best. I've been really yeah. happy since. Yes, I can only imagine. And in this new edition, what are some of the things that people can look forward to you expanding upon? So you'll see a few new stories. I mean, there were, there were things that I felt like when I finished the first one, things that I had missed, like most of the women I talked to had some kind of privilege, either, you know, they were middle class, like class privilege or educational privilege, because you know if you're poor, but you also have a PhD, you have something you can leverage. Um, mm -hmm. And I also wasn't able to get you know the voices of trans women into that first edition. And so you know both of those things have been corrected in the new edition. And there's a new chapter on power, because I think mm. black women have taken such a great role in you know, in the streets. So, you know, grassroots activism, you have three black women who started Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. 
Now we have the first biracial black woman as a vice president in the White House. That who is also your sorority sister. (laughs) (laughs) We got Stacey Abrams, like you know. So I wanted to speak to some of that, some of the ways that black women are using their power, and some of the ways we're doing all this work but not reaping the benefits because you know people don't treat us like they ought to. Yes, exactly. I have so many just positive thoughts about what the impact is going to be for young women to read this book. Um, I remember when I was a little girl, there was a book that my mom gave me called, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to miss the name of it, but it was a workbook by Iyama Van Zyne. I'm going to remember it later. Mm. I know it. I have you it. You know it. Yes, I have I it too. It. I know what you did. It's like little, it's like, yes. I, yeah. Yes, but I remember her giving me this book because I was this voracious reader and it had all of these like prompts in it and affirmations and things like that. And that coupled with like Maya Angelou just like helped me as a little girl, like trying to figure some stuff out. Mm -hmm. And I think that Dear Black Girl has the same like power attached to it to really like help young women. Um, What are some of the the letters that just stick out to you um, the most when you think about the book? So there are a few. One chapter that I'm really proud of is the chapter about families and relationships with mothers and fathers, because Mm -hmm. so often Black people are told that our families are dysfunctional or less or less than um, Mm -hmm. because of the, the different ways our families work, because we have a lot of extended families. We have, you know, big mamas raising grandkids. We have, you know, single moms raising kids. We have single dads raising kids. And we're, we've been told since like the sixties, since the Moynihan report that, that, that you can't have a functional family that way. So many women wrote, I mean, I opened that chapter talking about the fact that historically, you know, African peoples have always had this really expansive view of what family means. Black mm-hmm. people have had an expansive view of what family means. We're forever adding a play cousin or a play auntie. And, you know, so mm-hmm. like, don't let your idea of family be narrow. And so, you know, one woman, Rochelle Riley, who was a wonderful writer on, on her own, wrote about yes being raised by her grandparents um, because her parents broke up and her mom was ill. And so she was raised by her grandparents and all of the things that they, they did for her and how valid that family was. Um, another friend, Disha Filia, who's also a, a writer, the author of Secret Lives of Church Ladies, wrote about her difficult relationship with her father um, who was not active and, you know, her mom wanted to kind of force a relationship and that didn't really work out. Um, the Reverend Brandy Mamitzraim wrote about um, mothering. It's, um, she, she, she writes like we daughter and daughter is hard. Yes. About oh, all the different yeah. ways, you know, you interact with your mom. But then, you know, the other thing I thought was important is I wanted to get a diversity of women because I wanted Black girls to see themselves in all the ways they show up in the world. So um, Tatiana Rebel, who people know locally, is <laughs> amazing, amazing yes, poet. Yes, she's phenomenal. Um, wrote a letter to the queer and questioning Black girl. Um, I have letters from um, women who've been sexually assaulted. Um, letters from women who are corporate bosses, letters of a letter of a letter from uh, Keisha Dixon of Asante Children's Theater, letter from LaShonda Crow Storm who talks about being an artist, letters from women who have been sexually assaulted, um, um, incarcerated, um, women writing about their brown skin, women writing about being biracial. Um, like there's like a gamma a trans woman writing about the first time she saw herself in a bra and panties and felt good about herself. All mm. of these women like sharing their experiences, their diverse experiences, the, you know, true, honest and vulnerable. Yes. 
Oh my gosh, just phenomenal. And I hate to put you on the spot because I did not prep you for this. Um, but do you have a letter that you could read or an excerpt of a letter you could read? Never put me on the spot. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. She's like, listen, you ain't got I, to get ready if you stay ready. <laughs> I, right. You don't got to get ready if you're yes. already ready. I would like to share the epilogue of the book because I think it kind yes. of sums up what I'm what I'm feeling and what I think is important about the book. So um, the epilogue is called Pick Up Your Oyster Knife. Mm. I love you, Black girl. I love Black girls in Afro puffs and Black girls in bundles of Remy. I love the daddy's girls and the fatherless ones. I love the little sisters who make straight A's and the ones who skip school. I love the hood girls and the suburban girls and the country girls too. I love the quiet girls and the loud girls, the lip smacking, smart talking ones. I love the saved girls and the heathens. I love the girls who stay in sweatshirts and J's and the ones in tight Fashion Nova fits. I love the happy girls and the anxious girls and the girls battling depression. I love the trans girls living defiantly. I love the girls in the library and the ones on the basketball court. I love the virgins and the young mamas. I love the girly girls and the bitch girls. I love the girls who fight. I love the girls who love boys and the girls who love girls and the girls who love both or neither. I love you, Black girl, unconditionally, whether you are 15 or 50. You hear me? Today, I love you whether you look or act like they say you should. You are not wrong. And when you are wrong, I love you with all your flaws, no matter what choices and mistakes you have made, no matter where you live, no matter what you look like, no matter what thing has happened to you. And the greatest thing that you can learn is to love yourself unconditionally too. It may be the hardest thing you have to learn. I hope the letters in this book have shown you how. One other thing, Black girl, you must learn to love other Black women and girls the same way. Love us whether we look or act like they say we should. We are not wrong. And when we are wrong, love us with all our flaws. No matter what choices and mistakes we have made, no matter where we live, no matter what we look like, no matter what thing has happened to us. This doesn't mean that you have to become the target for another black girl's pain or anger or trauma. It doesn't mean you have to silence yourself in the face of black women. It means you must give your sisters grace and understanding the benefit of the doubt. So few people give us that. We owe it to each other. We have to acknowledge each other's humanity, even maybe especially when we are walking away. I hope the letters in this book have shown you how to do that too. Because we are sisters, Black girl. We have to take care of ourselves and each other. You are me, I am you, and we are all right. Inside each of us are tiny pieces of our foremothers, Sarah Boone's ingenuity, Danya Luna's unforgettable beauty, Toni Morrison's incomparable wisdom, Mamie Till's fierce love, Aretha Franklin's creativity, Marsha P. Johnson's fearlessness, Harriet Tubman's will to survive, Katherine Johnson's genius, Michelle Obama's grace. Black girls are made of all that magic, birthed in the African sun, baptized by the Middle Passage and burnished by America. That is a power that no one else can claim, just us. We are sisters, you are me, I am you, and we will get free together. Zora Neale mm -hmm. Hurston, a great black woman writer once said, I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. An oyster knife is a utensil used to crack open the shell of an oyster to get the tasty meat inside. Zora meant that she wasn't wasting time thinking about the hard parts of being black and a woman, and she didn't care what other people said about her. She was busy trying to get at all that good stuff life had to offer. Celebrate your black girl life, celebrate us, be like Zora, 
get that oyster girl. Mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> that oyster with the hot sauce and the horseradish and everything yes. else. <laughs> everything else all the fixings oh I have goosebumps Tammy that is just amazing amazing uh I was thinking you know about the book and I wanted to ask you if you could write a letter to someone that you haven't written a letter to um who would that be and um who would you like to write you a letter and it could be anyone. I know. I know. I'm extra. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So if I could have someone write me a letter, it would be like one of my foremothers, like one of my ancestors, even like one of my grandmothers. I mean, who, who I, of course, knew, but I feel like um, you know, my, my maternal grandmother died, I think I was maybe mid twenties. And I mm. feel like you never appreciate your elders when you were really young. And now there yes. are so many things that I wish that I could ask them or so many things that I wish I could ask them, like, like that maybe they wanted for me or wanted to tell me. Um, that maybe their generation wouldn't allow them to tell me or just about their lives. So I would love to get letters from them. I'd love to get the letters from my foremothers to kind of strengthen our connection. If I was going to write a letter to yeah. somebody, man, I might write a letter. I mean, this book was a, was a love letter to my nieces but if I was mm -hmm. gonna write a letter, I might write it to someone like um, Darnella Frazier, who is, was the young woman, 17 years old, who captur captured George Floyd's death on campus. Mm. Because I yeah. think they're like, she has not been celebrated enough for what she did. That was extremely bra brave. And I worry for her sometimes because right after that happened, she talked about how people we're saying she should have done more um, and she didn't do enough. And she's a child. She's a child yeah. that witnessed a vicious murder. And sometimes yeah. we forget that girls are children. I mean, research shows that we forget girls are children. Yeah. I mean, the Georgetown study that came out a few years ago said girls as young as five were seen as adult-like. And yeah. so I just hope there are people around her that are telling her that she's okay, that she's more than okay, she's amazing. But I also hope she's getting the support and the help and the professional help if she needs it. And I just, you know, would want to tell her that we love her and that we support her and we hope she's okay. Yes. Oh my gosh. For bravery too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. And I, I hope that, you know, through some universal means she's able to receive that love because like, I literally could not imagine um, just minding your business and witnessing something like that and recording it and then having the whole world be on your ass like you did something wrong. And, yeah. to, not turn, and to not turn away. I mean, yeah. because I mean, she was in danger too. Like if they're killing, like if they're killing this man in front of you, I mean, who's to say that like you won't get drawn into it. It's not like exactly. they cared about any black person's life. So, I mean, the fact that yeah. she, the child stood there, you know, that's significant. So, you know, I could just talk to you forever and ever and ever about anything under the sun. So thank you so much for your time. How can people thank keep up with you? Me. You're yes. welcome. I, first I have to, my own love fest. I love Ebony so much. We have oh. known each other. Like I've seen, just, I've seen you grown, like grow so much. I remember meeting you at the paper and you were like new and you were doing marketing and you were young and you were just starting out and just to see yeah. like what you're doing now and the way you've grown in the community and in your stature is just like amazing. You are one of the all right black women that I know. Oh. And I'm proud to know so. Thank you so <laughs> much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, but yes. you, you, know, you asked how people could reach me. My website is TamaraWinfreyHarris.com. Um, and so you can start there. And I hope you will sign up for my monthly newsletter and to keep 
um, keep up to date on the things that I'm doing. I have a lot of appearances coming up for the book, so you can keep. We love to hear it there. Um, <laughs> Tamara Winfrey Harris on Facebook. Um, what Tammy said on Twitter and Tamara Winfrey Harris on Instagram. So check me out, or or you can come to our Black Women's Writing Society on the second Tuesday of every month. Yes, at 6 p.m. Eastern. Yes. <laughs> yes, we would love to have you. <laughs> well, thank you again, Tammy, and be sure to get this for all of the wonderful Black girls in your life. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. talk to Tammy all day. She is incredible, incredible, incredible. So go out and get a copy of Dear Black Girls wherever books are sold. Um, bonus points for you if you buy it from a local Black-owned bookstore. Check that out. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Have a great day and a positive week, y'all. Peace.